All right, so today's video is going to be another one for the cybersecurity versus software engineering playlist that we have. So today we are joined by Luca, who is hey a software engineer. He also has a channel, so definitely check it out in the link in the description. And for those of you who are new to my channel, I am Sandra, and I currently work as a security analyst. And today we're going to be answering questions on all things early career, just comparing our experiences in the last three to four years of mm -hmm. working as a SWE and working as a cybersecurity professional. Sounds good. So first things first, we're gonna start off with the juiciest question, which is with our initial starting salary. So, Luca, you can go first. <laughs> I'm going first? <laughs> yeah, so I want to say like, uh, right out of college, I got a return offer from my previous internship, and uh, the offer was about 80K for the Delaware area. So for that location, it's actually pretty competitive. And uh, mm -hmm. I later got a few other offers, such as like one of them was the one that I decided to go with, which is Google. And uh, for Google, it's a very, very straightforward. Like, you either have a competing offer that's like from Airbnb or someone who pays you a lot, or you're pretty much just gonna get the standard beginner salary compensation. So for the West Coast, the standard starting package was 120k base salary plus 100k stock over four year. I forgot how much a scion bonus it was, but I, I think it was about 40k. Does that sound right? 40? I, 40, I don't remember. Yeah, yeah, it, it been a long time, but it was something like pretty high to be honest. Like, And uh, the scion bonus was also something that I tried to negotiate. But then of course, like I had to change location. So there, there was some other stuff happening. But uh, yeah, that was uh, pretty much the overall total compensation, I think it came out to be around 200k for the first year. So my starting salary, um, this was the one that I talked about in my previous videos, which I can link down below for negotiations and things like that. But I started off in a rotation program, it was a cybersecurity rotation program for a financial institution. And I originally was offered $105,000 in the New York City metro area. And then I negotiated and mm -hmm. got that up to 115. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't get any sign-on bonuses or relocation mm -hmm. or anything fancy like a bank company. But eventually, I ended up getting some RSUs. You got the stock. Pretty yeah, much they give it to you. But it was down the line. You had to work for like a year. They give it to you, and then it doesn't vest again uh, for another year. Refresh. So, it's like stock refresh. Yeah. So yeah. you don't actually get it until two years after you start. Which, gotcha. Yeah. So. Yeah, for, for Google, like if you join, you don't get refresh until your second year. So like, okay. if, even if you join January, you won't get your stock refresh until, you know, a year later. They recently changed that policy. All right, next up, we're going to talk a little bit about growth in our early careers. Mm -hmm. Obviously, from entry mm -hmm. to early career, there may be like, yeah. maybe like a small promotion or title promotion. Sure. Salary increases. Yeah, I guess like the focus for growth, I guess there, I, I see it more like two ways, like how much knowledge you growing as an individual, something that mm -hmm. you can't really measure with like monetary values. And of course you have like the title promotion and the monetary promotion, like salary bump. So I would say like during my time while I was working, like I learned so much, like it was like crazy how much I learned and how much I realized the college classes were absolute going in the wrong direction. Like <laughs> what I learned in classes is like, doesn't really help me at all for software engineer especially like when the tax stack is so different. No one holding your hand, no teaching assistants who you can ask questions to. So like, it's more hands off. And I would say like that gave me a lot of value in learning. I would say like, this is that's the most I have learned in a long time. And I would say most likely what happens is like, depending on your rating, you can have really good rating, but the first rating you get, it's always like too new to evaluate, mm -hmm. depending on when you join. So like the most likely your first cycle will be like meets all, cause like they don't, have a legitimate rating for you just yet. And then after that, depending on your rating, directly reflect how much salary increase you can get. And uh, generally speaking, in order to get to the next level, they want you to perform at the next level already for at least two performance review cycle. So before Google had this two performance review cycle a year, but now they're shifting towards the one review a year. So I don't know how they're gonna calculate like how long you have been, so like a lot of this is up to your manager. So manager relationship and getting up to work on good project really matters. I would say overall, you can't expect too much salary growth, even if you get title promotion, just because you're already performing at the next level. Your salary kind of already reflected. That's the algorithm part. Like they make it so like your salary is already at the next level before you get promoted. Mm -hmm. So when you get promoted, all you really get is like the additional bonus. And 
you won't see a dramatic change in your salary. Now that's interesting to know because I feel like when people hear that you get promotions, they're yeah. thinking like 20-30% yeah, raises. Yeah, like double your salary. Boom. Yeah. Yeah, that is not what happens, especially yeah. in your early career unless you're like going into like the MD level um, yeah. or like the director. Yeah, director level yeah. for tech. Yeah, I think for me as well, the salary increases were also very small. I do think I learned a lot and my first year in my job or after the first year, I actually got my certification for my security plus and i think that definitely helped me not monetary in my career but it helped me overall with the i think trajectory of my career sure. just for the roles that i can apply to and mm -hmm. the different types of companies that would want to hire me in cybersecurity. and i think for salary i really only got like a small-ish bump um it's like the mm -hmm. typical like one two three percent that you would get at a normal company and that was after graduating from my rotation program yeah i think i mentioned it earlier but i also ended up getting the rsus or restricted stock units but it was kind of like an extra bonus it's also vested for four years so basically mm -hmm. the 100 percent of your stocks that you get you split it by 25 percent for four years and you get that much every year but yeah the longer that you work at the company the more that you get because every year you're gonna get yeah RSUs. more and more snowballing. yeah so it, yeah. yeah it's like a snowball effect you yeah. end up getting more the better you perform yeah um, and the longer that you're at the company mm -hmm. so yeah I think overall growth not necessarily slow I feel like we are definitely very fortunate yeah. to start at relatively high starting salaries I would think yeah like it's crazy to think cuz like back in college even before I switched into computer science I studied electrical engineer or something like mm -hmm. we were hoping for like you know 60 70 K like 60, that's already that's like number that, that's already like a really competitive starting salary like mm -hmm. No way, like I expected to get in pay like more than 100k right out of college. So like, yeah. yeah. So I think we don't want to, you know, send out jaded vibes to you guys thinking that, oh, we only got 100k for our starting salaries out of college. Mm -hmm. um, it's definitely not the case. We were definitely very fortunate to yeah. be in a position to even be able to negotiate our salaries or sure. be able to work at companies who offered us this amount of salary out of college. And another caveat, just something to note, like I'm, I'm sure it's the same for you, like the stock refresh and the vesting, like sure they promise this much, but you only get to keep what you are already vested. So if you leave before the four year mark, you only mm -hmm. get whatever already vested. Everything else is just gone. Yeah, I think that's why in tech there's that term golden handcuffs where yeah, too much every year yeah, yeah. you you know, get some kind of stock refresh or maybe get a promotion and you kind of want to stay because you have this extra money on the table mm -hmm. and you're kind of leaving it behind. Yeah, and, and they keep giving you something. It's kind of like putting snack trails that yeah. you just chase off. Definitely an interesting phenomenon. I'd be interested to see how that changes, like, the, you know, after the recession and with yeah. so many people saying things like tech salaries are overinflated and yeah. like there's going to be changes coming up. So it'll be interesting to see how that actually affects the overall yeah, for sure. Tech sector. All right, so the next opportunity is travel. How much we travel at work, um, how that changed like during work the travel yeah, or work travel. Okay. Yeah, I would say like uh, as an engineer, I actually don't expect to travel that much. And that was pretty much the reality. Maybe like once every year, we have this uh, huge director level product area conference that uh, we just get together to celebrate what we have accomplished this year, learn mm -hmm. about other teams' accomplishments, and uh, think about the roadmap for the upcoming year. So I would say that's the one time that we get to travel. During the pandemic, for the past two years, it has been virtual. So once again, mm -hmm. like not a lot of travel opportunities. So I would say like, yeah, like on average, I would say anything around one, maybe two, if there's a reason for you to attend some conference and your manager think it's a valid uh, conference for you to attend. Yeah, I would say same for my previous role. I the majority of my travel was done through conferences. Well, I guess before the pandemic, I attended more conferences, but I probably attended about mm. three or four in-person <laughs> conferences. Yeah. Um, I mean, one of them was the Grace Hopper Conference, which happens every year. Mm -hmm. And that one was more so for like professional development and recruitment sure. purposes. But yeah, I definitely think I was very lucky to be in a role because I know like in my previous company, people, a lot of people wanted to go to those conferences. And in my current role, I have done one kind of like team company yeah. on-site so it was company-wide and we basically all just got together and um, it was also my first time meeting people that I've been working with remotely and yeah that was definitely a lot of fun um, it was about a week I mean obviously we are working remotely um, which is the next topic that we're actually gonna talk about mm -hmm. I don't do as much travel compared to someone who might be you know a consultant who may be moving to uh, their different customers sites and things yeah. like that so consulting you know. sales like those people like definitely travel a lot more than tech yeah. yeah. Our next thing, as we hinted at, is working remotely. 
a bit of a spoiler, but we both are currently working remotely. So I would say like uh, for my company, going remote is fairly straightforward. Most likely you will have to work here for a year just so they have some sort of record of your performance review. And uh, if you are someone who is performing really, really well, then applying for remote is just simply clicking the application button and then switch to remote. And uh, I would say it really depends on your team. So most of my teammates are actually not remote. They prefer hybrid either because they live really close to the office, like walking distance, or they are someone who worked at a previous company that was remote. So they wanted to go in and, uh, you know, get the free food and stuff like that. So like enjoy the perks. And I also know a lot of other of my cross fans who are remote. And uh, yeah, so I would say overall the team, broader team is actually pretty diverse. And we also have people, co-workers working from different locations. So like that technically is a sort of remote because like you don't really get to see your coworker in person so i would say overall it's pretty flexible yeah for my previous company i originally working full-time in the office until the pandemic and then started working from home and then after that we're going to transition back into the office and i've touched on it a little bit on my channel but um, my team was originally going to be full-time back in the office with no hybrid setup and that was originally what i would have wanted so yeah my current role I am fully remote and my team is also fully remote. Actually, we're like a remote first company, so nice. uh, we do have offices, but most people work remotely. So I think that's definitely something to note. And honestly, now I prefer working remotely. If there was ever a time when I wanted to go back into the office, I would probably prefer some kind of hybrid, but more so just like based on what people want to do. Like Exactly. Like not yeah. hybrid, but more so like uh, you want to go your team office, can decide like, oh, let's, let's all go in like maybe next week like on wednesday or something like mm -hmm. give you the choice like yeah yeah i think the flexibility of choice is very important yeah i think that's the main thing for me as well like i wouldn't mind going to the office it's just the idea that they force you to go in twice a week i i don't know about that that's why like i would rather be like remote and then go in wherever i want all right next thing is going to be an interesting one and it is how boring slash interesting your work is so how often do you find yourself bored versus how often do you find yourself having fun or being challenged mm -hmm. at work i think a lot of times when i like recall it's like my first joint it's like definitely exciting all the tasks were very challenging so like you know that keep you engaged but also at the same time like stressful so i would say once i become more used to the tech stack like how everything works it becomes a lot more fun and uh, at the same time I, i'm getting more and more challenging tasks from my manager so i can get promoted of course and uh that made it challenging and fun. I think the only time I was really bored is when there's too much like decision makings, which is very, very low. Like maybe for like a week where in between projects, like we don't know what we can do for the next one. Maybe like we run into some like legal or privacy concerns that we want to resolve before we can move forward. Then like I'm stuck in kind of period where I'm not doing actual work, but I'm doing like engineering excellent work, like making the code better or like seeing areas that can help improve i wouldn't say i was necessarily bored ever i would say like when you're not doing much it could be considered like boring but i was overall very engaged and i think that's something like i enjoy a lot i mean then again it's kind of sad it's like non-stop task one after the other but at least they keep you engaged i think because i was part of a rotation program it definitely made it harder to get bored because the jobs that i was in were just one year of rotations and i think i was able to learn a lot in all those roles since they were also different but i think one thing that i noticed was probably the part that i disliked the most slash found the most boring was working with spreadsheets and excel and obviously i am not a accounting finance person but there's a lot of cybersecurity metrics that are put in excel spreadsheets to <laughs> share with senior yeah. leadership um to present during calls to just calculate certain things that we have because mm -hmm. obviously telemetry and just metrics in general can be hard to wrangle with when you you know don't have like a data scientist or someone yeah. that's actually actively digging through the data so we rely heavily on excel for a lot of things and personally i've never been a huge person who loves doing the v lookups and the uh pivot tables and stuff like that but yeah so i think that was the part where i found myself nice. kind of getting a little bit bored and like having to meticulously look through different things manually um, having some, you know, we obviously had some kind of like gut check in the Excel spreadsheet, but Except, a lot of the work was manual. Yeah. Uh, 
need it, maybe yeah. you need that database. Yeah, and there are definitely days where I was just working through Excel for like the entire day for like four or five hours, and those would not be very fun. And especially because it's recurring, so you have to do it like on a weekly basis or on a monthly basis. So yeah, I, I would think that's probably the part where it gets a little bit boring, but everything else, it's kind of cool and new, especially in your early career. All right, so hopefully we answered a lot of your questions about our experiences being able to work remotely. Mm -hmm. um, obviously we have kind of different, but similar experiences, but it honestly it will all depend on your team, the company you're going sure. to, yeah. if you're remote or in person or hybrid, just the overall team culture that, that you're going to be going into. And if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe and turn on post notifications. I post videos every Wednesdays and Sundays at 12 p.m. And Luca posts videos every Saturdays at 12 p.m. So definitely check out his videos on software engineering and all things tech careers linked in the description below. And hopefully we'll see you guys in our next videos. Bye. Bye.